Hey guys, I'm Janet on occasion, and today we have a roster reveal, so I'm going to reveal the roster that has, well, it's been revealed, but I'm going to talk about it. That makes sense? Yeah, sure, why not? So, uh, yeah, Total Warhammer 3 Kislev roster reveal, which uh, obviously is very exciting, because uh, we get to see it all now. We get to see uh, everything that we, may, we might be missing, you know, that we may have not seen yet. Uh, although it does seem like we've seen most of it, but, uh, well, now we know, and it's good to. Clarity is always important. So, uh, Ben Barrett, thank you for this. That's lovely. Uh, welcome to the roster reveal for Kislev. Unthanked in their endless task of standing as the bulwark against chaos to protect the realms of man, the men, the women, and bears of Kislev are resolute in not allowing their homeland to become corrupted. From the lowliest farmer to the mightiest bear rider, the snow leopard that prowl the wastes to the living embodiment of the land itself and the people's god, all are prepared to fight for every inch of territory and never allow chaos to gain a foothold. Should they fall, all will surely follow. Below, you'll find lore, notes in the odd detail on every unit you can recruit in these northern lands. Note that Total War Warhammer 3 is still in development and everything is subject to change, hence why we haven't given you the exact damage and health values for everything below. Consider these guidelines and the odd T's rather than set in stone, and prepare to lead Kislev to conquer their demons. Lovely stuff. So, first off, Zarina Katarin. We're all well aware of Zarina Katarin. We've seen her in action. I've even had the the uh, the privilege of being able to control her in a battle, which has been very fun. Um, she's um, mad. I love it. Um, she's got a job to do, and she's capable of doing it. Blasting uh, ice magic everywhere. Killing demons. She seems good at it. Um, I enjoyed my time with her. So... Ascending to the throne and crown in the wake of her father's bloody death, fighting against the hordes of chaos, Catherine has wasted no time cementing her grip upon Kislev. She is, in every way, a totalitarian ruler. She is stern and unflinching, and will readily have rivals removed by agents of the crown if she cannot win them over with cold reason. The base of Catherine's power, beyond hereditary right, is her extraordinary magical prowess. She is the greatest ice witch for generations, capable of magical feats more deadly and devastating than any other ice witch in Kislev. The leader of the Ice Court, Catherine is more adapt to training and maintaining the Frost Maidens who call it home, and the Ice Guard who protect them. As the most powerful ice witch of her age, she is unlikely to miscast, and as the ruler of Kislev, she crushes rebellion and corruption wherever she goes. Mounts, Warhorse, and Warbear. That's right, we can put her on a bear. Which uh, I'm a bit disappointed at, actually. Uh, I mean, bears are cool and everything, but everyone seems to be on a bear. Um, but genuinely, everyone seems to be on a... Just, you'll see, everyone's on a bear, okay? There's bears for days. You can't move for bears. I was really hoping she'd have a sled. You know, one of her ice sleds as a mount. I think her just sort of sat on the back of it would be a lot more graceful. Um, you know, pointing... Pointing the, uh, the, the, the... I don't know, whoever... What? Who would you call a person who who, you know, is like the coach, I guess, the coach driver, but for a ice sled, the sled driver, the, the, I guess the driver, <laughs> I guess just the driver, right? Anyway, uh, yeah, her sort of directing the driver to where she wants to go and blasting spells, um, anything that, uh, that comes too close. I think that'd be quite cool to see, but no, nope, she'll just be on a bear like everybody else, which I know is going to make her look really quite silly when she's being, you know, flung back and forth as the bear runs around. That's just all, all sort of monstrous, um, mounts tend to, tend to sort of make the people look a bit strange to sort of attach to the back of them going Whoa! you know being thrown around um it's kind of a classic in in total war warhammer but you know a bit of a shame i'd like i'd like to see more grace there but bears are cool so whatever so selection of unique spells abilities or skills law master law of ice Catherine is a complete master of the lore of ice, making her spells deadlier, cheaper, and faster. So, of course, there is the lore of Tempest in the game as well, but she doesn't have it. Um, it's an important thing to mention. So we will have um, Tempest wizards or witches or whatever, something, um, running about the place. So that'll be fun. But she is focused on ice, uh, as she was in the lore. So, makes sense. Frostfang, Catherine's legendary blade. Frostfang bestows upon her a huge number of incredible uh, powers. Chief among them is its titular explosive spell, which again we did have in um, in the in the demo, and uh, that was a lot of fun. So, hopefully, we'll see uh, see plenty of that when when we get hands on her again. So, Supreme Patriarch Kostaltin, uh, you remember this guy? He's uh, he's the crazy lunatic. 
that we've uh, already heard about, but we can always hear some more, so let's. Urson is not a vicious god, although he is both brutal and merciless in times of war. To his followers, he is fatherly and large. Castelton is the supreme patriarch of the Ursonite cult, and as the highest ranking clergy in the nation, the de facto leader of the Great Orthodoxy. With wild hair, wilder eyes, and uh, with a thin limbs, Castelton is a ghoulish figure, robed in the finery of resurgent Ursonite faith. He is a howling, angry firebrand, screaming furious rhetoric at the enemy and urging the warriors around him to fight on with a fearful mixture of encouragement and threat. For he is himself fearless, able to recover from any wound quickly and thus inspire his flock to run pell-mell at foes that any sane person would flee. With complete control of the faith that binds Kislev together, Castelton whips his followers into a holy fervour. He despises the machinations of the Tsarina and her ice court and considers them usurpers and magic-wielding heretics. So interesting that we got the, the two um, the characters are at odds with each other, because the general trend for um, sort of total war um, at, least, at least initially it was you had your faction and then you picked which lord to play from that faction right that was something that was quickly sort of phased out um, you know later on but originally that was the thing you know you picked your faction and then you pick a lord now you just pick your lord and every lord has their own sort of sub faction and things so the idea that you have a choice of two Kislev uh, factions and they have very good reason to end up at arms against one another um, I think is kind of cool because that's the thing with the sort of the re uh, you know the release roster um, of any faction you're gonna be limited by the amount of uh, amount of sort of combinations of things you're gonna be facing up against so the idea of having some you know some fairly feasible way um, to have an excuse to, to fight uh, your own kind if, if confederacy isn't um, gonna work you know confederation isn't gonna isn't gonna fly then uh, yeah war so be it sounds like a lot of fun so a uh, selection of unique spells abilities or skills Urson's ward so Castelton is an unkillable paragon of his people and even the most mortal wounds simply power him to greater heights of ferocity as he faces down his enemies he's also a man of the people Castelton's fervor means he never lacks faithful loyal warriors to send into battle how that'll play out I have no idea is that just gonna be you know cheaper global like quick global recruitment times or something I don't know and like cheaper global recruitment maybe maybe that would actually be quite good I'd actually quite like to hear that although um, that would also be kind of odd in a way seeing as how I'm under the impression that he'd be home that he's sort of sticking around the house a bit and uh, you know whipping up everyone into a fervor uh, in Kislev rather than necessarily taking the fight to the enemy um, just because uh, Katarin's uh, faction is called uh, something along the lines of, uh, was it Katarin's Expedition, I think? Or the Tsarina's Expedition or something? So implying that she's on the march away. Uh, so unless they're both marching away from Kislev, trying to get to, you know, wherever they want to be. Um, that could be a thing. Who knows? They could be racing. They could be competing to sort of solve the problems uh, facing the world, you know, in the, in the campaign. So it'll be interesting to see. I mean, obviously, it might not be anything to do with global recruitment. I just made that up, but, you know, it seems to fit, right? I think that's a good fit. We'll see. So, Kislev Lords, we have the Boyar. We have the Boyar. So, it looks pretty damn cool, actually. I love the uh, I love the fact it's all concept art in this. I kind of prefer that over seeing just the, the actual renders. Uh, just seeing the concept art, I really like, because you're sort of seeing the roots of it all, which... Uh, I appreciate. So, ranking nobles, boyars are powerful men and women within Kislev. They each govern specific areas of Kislev, including scores, if not hundreds, of uh, stanitsas, as well as larger towns and small cities. Especially large cities are governed by boyars of singular prestige. This is a hereditary rank, although royal edict can raise one to the position. On the battlefield, they are tough and uh, dufty fighters and uh, the best in Kislev. So, Boyar serve the people in battle as extraordinary warriors, leading their forces from the front and clashing with enemies of every kind. They are a. Ugh, gave me tongue tied. Sorry. They are inspiring commanders and deadly foes. And mounts, warhorse and warbear. Again, hang on, let's look at Castelton as well. Mounts, warhorse and warbear. Everyone's on. Everyone's on a bear. Everybody. Ice Witch. Ice Witch. Love a good Ice Witch. So, Ice Witch. 
Kislev has no Colleges of Magic. Sorry, I'll scroll up a bit so you can see her. There you go. Uh, Kislev has no Colleges of Magic. Instead, its sorcery is derived from within the Ice Court and invariably reflects the brutal winters of Kislev. It is from this body that the Ice Witches are drawn. Their ice magic is the raw, murderous power of cold, harnessed as a weapon. From uh, frozen ground that binds the foe's feet to lances of icy death. While all magic is drawn from the raging winds, there is no doubt that ice magic is strongest when used within the borders of Kislev itself. I mean, that's obviously, you know, a nice bit of fluff, but I wonder if that will actually have any, uh, uh, you know, actual in-game ramifications. I kind of hope not. I think that would be a bit of a shame, although I think it would be kind of cool if that was um, a trend that Total War adopted generally if people had advantages on home territory more often. Because I think the idea of, of it being more difficult to conquer enemy territory than maintain your own territory, you know what I mean? Um, I'd like to see that encouraged some way or another, um, but I, I'm not sure this is a clue as to as to, you know, a burgeoning trend towards that in terms of game design. But uh, I think it would help sort of make um, uh, make it feel a bit more uh, uh, more of a big deal conquering somewhere um, in, in Total War because things can get very... Um, well, once you've got two stacks, you just auto-resolve every battle and that's a bit of a shame. Um, so it would be nice if there were some inherent advantages and disadvantages uh, depending on location. I think it would be quite interesting. Um, besides climate, because climate's sort of boring and sort of takes choice out of your hands a bit. But anyway, let's uh, let's crack on. So, uh, Law of Ice, which specialises in uh, disrupting enemy movement, freezing them to death, as well as encasing allies in protective barriers or equipping them with armor-piercing weapons. Ice Sheet, Ice Maiden's Kiss, Frost Blades, Death Frost, Crystal Sanctuary, and Heart of Winter. So we've seen all these um, in the demo already. Uh, in the gameplay demo, uh, Zorri and the Catherine had access to all of these spells. So um, we have seen them here and there across uh, across the internet. So I won't go into um, too much detail about them, but Heart of Winter is my favorite. It's the big one that's a lot like Final Transmutation. It's a big area of effect, damaging spell that the longer you're in it, the more damage it does. It, it accelerates the uh, the damage that it deals and it also it uh, increases the amount that it slows the enemy. So the longer you, you wait in it, the harder it'll be to get out of it. So I really like it. It looks really cool, so you know. Things, things, things that look cool look cool, and that's a good thing, because cool is a positive thing, and I like cool, because uh, I'm young and hip. Honest. So, uh, Law of Tempest. So, Law of Tempest will also be available to, uh, to. It is Ice Witches, right? Yeah, Ice Witches still get Law of Tempest. I guess it makes sense, because you know it's still. Um, although it's not the Law of Ice, it is still uh, sort of weather adjacent, you know. Uh, so anyway, Lord of Tempest, which speeds allies and sends enemies to a swift death, harried from all sides by incredible blizzards and the biting cold. So none of these we've seen. We haven't seen any of these yet. Uh, I've had no uh, no way of seeing these just yet. I can't wait to get my hands on some Tempest because uh, new new laws of magic is just always a lot of fun. They really mix up the gameplay a lot. So gust of true flight, hailstorm, uh, swift wing, biting wind, hawks of Miska and Blizzard. So these are all incredibly, um, you know, they all sound like they could easily be in, in the Law of Ice. So they are very much two um, separate laws that are, you know, very similar in theme, which I really like. I like they have done that. Um, just adds more variety, you know, more gameplay variety is good. So, uh, and again, Warhorse or Warbear, everyone gets a bear. Just everyone, just straight up everyone gets a bear, guys. Uh, which again, it'd be nice if Maybe they had the sleds uh, and something, because like a war bear is always going to be a good like brawling thing, right? It's a flipping bear, so um, yeah, just make it so e even the spellcasters are good in like a brawling situation. In a way, I kind of get it. You know, it does fit with Kislev being like a very stubborn bunch, but I feel like the uh, like defenses of an ice sled, you know, would be quite uh, quite good. So we don't want anything to be glass cannons. But also, the idea of being on a war bear, it got big like armor piercing damage. It just feels like that's the weapon. It's no longer the spells of the weapon. It's the bear that's the weapon, right? And that I find is a bit. That does bother me somewhat. I'd like to see some more variety there, you know, not just in terms of like 
more mount options, just more variety in terms of gameplay variety. Sometimes limiting um, a character to something is actually good for gameplay variety, because if every Lord and Hero has the same mount, they're all going to have that armor-piercing damage, the same speed, they're all going to feel very similar. Um, to command, they just have different abilities to use, but it'd be nice if they had more distinction between them, but oh well. I'm sure the, the, the spellcasters probably have access to the bears at a lot higher level, so you'll probably be just content to stick them on a horse, but I don't know. So, Frost Maiden. Uh, this is the hero spellcaster. The first one was the Lord, of course. Uh, so the Frost Maiden, when the Tsarina's personal attention is not required, it falls to the women of the Ice Court to represent her might instead. Since the time of the Khan Queens, there has been an Ice Court, a powerful political body devoted to preparing the noble daughters of Kislev to take on positions of power. It is from this body that the Frost Maidens, Ice Witches yet to complete their training, are drawn. Akin to their academy, the Ice Court schools the young women within its halls in matters of diplomacy, intrigue and sorcery. I do, I do love the sort of, um, the fact it's sort of, uh, it, it's a country led by coven, almost, you know, there's a lot of, um, whether it be the sort of religious acts, aspects or the magical aspects, um, it's all very shamanistic and, um, it feels very pagan, you know, which, uh, I really like, you know, it, they're a lot closer to the, the raw stuff of chaos, there's a lot more sort of, um, nonsense, you know, trolls and things coming in. It all feels very much more um, severe, all of the sort of nightmarish nonsense. Um, so I kind of like that. I kind of like they lent into that. It's, it's a lot less formal. It's, um, yeah, this rulership by coven, <laughs> I think is probably the best way to say it. But uh, I really like that. I think it's a really interesting aspect. But it just seems to be like different cults vying for power, um, which I think is very cool. So, uh, Laws, Ice or Tempest, uh, the Ice Witches, sorry, Frost Maidens, uh, there's Ice Witches and Frost Maidens. Frost Maidens turn into Ice Witches, there we go. They evolve, like Pokemon. Um, <laughs> so, uh, when you give them an Ice Stone, there we go. Um, and again, Warbear, even, even the heroes, Warbear. They all get Warbears. Patriarch, we know gets a Warbear as well, because, uh, well, again, we've had a Patriarch in the, in the gameplay demo, which is very awesome. So, the Patriarch. I really do like the look of the Patriarch as well. Very, um... Well, culty, which is good. So, the Senators of the Kislevide Faith. Bombastic, loud, and proud of their creed. They exhort the warriors around them to acts of courage, protecting them with the power of faith. Patriarchs stride into battle, bellowing the folk songs of the Kislevide people with the cadence of battle hymns, and mighty miracles of war are wrought by their belief. Bones of long-dead Kislevite heroes are carried in reliquary boxes, and those nearby take heart, although whether they hold any true magical properties remains a topic of speculation. And again, that's um, actually very reminiscent of um, uh, the the Grail reliquaries, because um, the idea of, of, of carrying relics of something. Obviously, faith has genuine power in Warhammer, but... It doesn't mean that everything does, you know? But there is a potential for any of these sort of relics to, to have power, but they're inspiring nonetheless. Um, and it's one of those weird things where you'd be sort of stupid not to be superstitious, because in Warhammer, like I said, faith has power, you know? Having faith in things lets you literally just, like, shoot lightning out of the sky, and, you know, it, your weapon becomes ablaze as you tear through, uh, you know, enemies of chaos. Like, there's, you know... Um, Sorry, not Enemies of Chaos, Empires of Man, or Chaos. Um, yeah, like, so it, you'd be stupid not to be superstitious, frankly. So, you know, lucky rabbit's foot, yeah, I'd be covered in them. <laughs> just in case, just in case there's a big rabbit god who likes me collecting his people's feet. Maybe not the rabbit god. I'd have to hope there was no rabbit god. But um, someone who hates rabbits, I don't know, something. Either way, I'd be very superstitious. You'd be dumb not to. So... Where they hold magical properties remains a topic of speculation, and uh, I like that. I like the mystery in uh, in that. So, ability selection, and what I like is they do have a good selection of, uh, of the different gods, and the fact that they're representing a widespread of the Pantheon I think is fantastic. I think it's really good. So you get Urson, who's, uh, who's uh, very similar to um, uh, Ulrich, 
So uh, similar to the wolf god is the bear god. They are very similar um, sort of uh, styles and uh, similar doctrine. But of course, um, you know, they probably wouldn't want to admit that necessarily. Uh, Dars. Uh, Dars is Song of Winter Sunlight. So Dars is the god of fire. Um, so more of, you know, sort of... Uh, uh, in, that, in that sort of more... Um, sort of keeping the winter off, basically. So there are there are other gods that are more about the hearth, that are more friendly, but this is more severe because you need that extreme heat to burn out the cold and the and the evil that's, you know, in the in the countryside. So pretty cool, pretty cool stuff. Uh, also, Thor's battle hymn. So Thor is actually Thor, essentially. It's, it's Warhammer's Thor analogue, which uh, is about time he turned up. He's a god of thunder. Funny that. So love that. I think that's really fun. And uh, Salyak. Uh, Salyak's lullaby, that's the healing one. So, um, Salyak is essentially Shalya. Um, but, again, Kislev twist on, uh, Shalya, who's the god of mercy. Um, and, uh, you know, sort of healing and things. Hates Nurgle. Um, nurses tend to be, you know, followers of Shalya in the Empire, uh, and in Bretonia. But, uh, Salyak is more about mercy, like, less trying to heal you and more putting you out of your misery is more of a trend with them. They're more willing to do that because uh, it's just a harsher place, Kislev. So it's about um, ending suffering, you know, in a sort of rugged, um, very efficient way because these people are a bit mad. <laughs> so, you know, they're a bit severe in Kislev. So I like that. I think that's interesting. It's um, Again, it just it mirrors Kislev. Um, the land is, is what sort of um, steers them towards their uh, their thinking you know their sort of moral compass is very very much dictated by uh, the, the the horrible lands that they live in so mounts war horse or war bear obviously you know always always so kislev units kislev missile infantry cossars are the mainstay of the Kislevite armies, regiments of grizzled and hardened fighters, drawn prim uh, primarily from among the many thousands of foresters and trappers who keep Kislev's um, stanitzas and cities fed. They fight with bows and axes, the two traditional weapons of the Cossars, symbolising the woodsman and the hunter. This ornate war gear is wrought to last a lifetime, if well cared for. Many is the wizened old Kislevite who has handed down their axe uh, sorry, handed their axe down to their grandchild, telling tall tales of the countless marauders or chaos beasts it has slain. While Cossars fight in regiments, they are not necessarily the most disciplined warriors, at least on the face of it. These hard-living lay folk of Kislev are fanta uh, fatalistic about the bitterness of warfare, drinking together by the fire at night and singing raucous anthems as they march, joking constantly at one another's expense. They wear light armour, if any at all. So, um... What I do like is uh, there's a big, uh, big uh, sort of uh, emphasis on uh, sort of variants, basically, sort of variant um, equipment, sort of layouts for for the various units, which I quite like. I quite like um, sort of every every unit has a lot of utility, and it means that at each sort of tier of infantry, you can have some variety, which I like. So um, that sounds fun to me. I like those sort of armies. So, variants of bow and axe or bow and spear. So you've got your potentially armor-piercing variant and you've got your anti-large variant. So, pretty cool. You know, makes them very flexible, which is definitely a theme of their army. So, notable characteristics. The backbone of the Kislevite army, cheap and easy to build. As with all Kislev units, uh, can keep their leadership in even the direst of circumstances. Early access to both bows and spears allows for a hybrid, powerful army from the off. So, you know, it's that versatility that's sort of inherent with um, the faction. Next up, we have the Streltsy. I really like the Streltsy. They're fantastic. They're probably uh, my favourite unit so far. So, Streltsy. The Streltsy were originally armed with bardishes and handguns in order um, that they could res uh, rest their firearm upon the crook of their polearm and thereby achieve greater accuracy. However, in an effort to get one more uh, shot off before the enemy closed upon them, the warriors would often run out of time to effectively stow their gun and ready their bardish. Instead, the heavy gun was often simply reversed and used as a bludgeon. Eventually, Streltsy captains took the radical step of embracing this alternative approach and had their uh, Rotas's rifles modified to include X-blades on the gun, uh, the gun stock. 
gun axes, guys. Gun axes. I love a good gun axe. So their, uh, their signature gun great axe is not even just a gun axe, guys. It's great. So their gun great axe represents both the coolest hybrid weapon in Warhammer history and one of the best. I've been, I keep saying that. Uh, also based on a real 16th century weapon. Couldn't care less. Real life's stupid. Real life's dumb. Warhammer's cool. Okay, suck it, nerds. So armored, and I just, I just want to annoy all the historical fans. <laughs> I, I, I love both games. Okay, please, please don't, don't at me. So uh, armored and armor piercing with decent melee abilities to go alongside their shooting prowess. So beautiful hybrid um, uh, units. They're very resilient and um, good in any occasion. You know. So, Ice Guard. Ice Guard, also very cool. Very cool indeed, but unfortunately they have just, you know, a bunch of different cool weapons rather than putting them all into one weapon, you know? No gun axe for them, so they lose points on that. But they are very cool, so... Anyway. Uh, in Kislev, the voice of a woman is equal to that of a man, and the worth of a ruler is judged by the wisdom of their rule and their might in battle. Perhaps that, more than any other reason, gave rise to the unusual sisterhood known as the Ice Guard. These are warrior elite of the Ice Court, a bodyguard for the Ice Witches, and who are imbued with the same magical power as their mistresses. They are fearsome and fearless, conditioned to put Kislev first and face the vilest horrors of the old world without hesitation. The Ice Guard is staffed by formidable warrior women, sent to the Boca Palace before they reach adolescence. These youths are then sorted for their aptitude for magic. Those with the gift begin a training regimen that will enable them to take the place within the Ice Court. Sorry, take their place within the Ice Court, a clandestine place of intrigue and power, typically headed by the senior matriarch of the Kislevite royal family. So, sorry, the Catherine, even before she was uh, Zarina. Um, unless her mother was alive when her dad was alive, and then I guess she would be the one. Anyway, whatever. Um, she She's in charge now. <laughs> Let's leave it at that. So, uh, each weapon these women wield is imbued with ice magic, glowing with its, inner, uh, its own inner light. So, very reminiscent of um, the Sisters of Avalon, which uh, I really like too. They're very cool units, so very, very similar vibe. Uh, variants bow and dual sword so good sort of anti-infantry you know dual wielding uh, damage dealers there as well as there are also bows obviously and uh, or bow and glaive so you get a choice between a sort of damage dealer um variant or the or the good armor piercing uh, anti-large so very very cool either way they got bows and uh, they both have magic damage so they're pretty great they're pretty great. So notable characteristics, fearless and stout, the women of the Ice Guard will face any foe. Frostbite consumes targeted enemies, slowing them. So uh, yeah, you shoot someone, they get slowed down, much like um, you know the frostbite attacks of, uh, of like ice wolves and you know most of the Norsekin roster, to be honest. So pretty cool, pretty cool. And again, fit the you know the northern ice magic vibes. Uh, Anti-infantry and anti-large variants make them another useful hybrid unit for Kislev armies. Then we have Armoured Cossars. We already have the Cossars, these ones are Armoured Cossars. Armoured Cossars are full-time soldiers, either paid by the Crown or simply supported by their wealthy families. As such, their time is spent entirely either training or carousing. They are dour, grim-faced killers on the battlefield, but after the battle is done, they are most belligerent, boisterous and hard-drinking of all the celebrants at a victory feast. Arrogance, reinforced by undeniable results, these are warriors as good as an ordinary man can hope to become. They wear heavy armour above the waist and sturdy reinforced boots, though their legs are clad only in baggy trousers. So yeah, very, very cool. Very cool indeed. So these are basically just the Cossars that have, you know, <laughs> made a name for themselves. Uh, so variants, pistol and axe, or pistol and great mace. So really nice again with the you know each each sort of unit has has variety within it, which I really like. Big big fan of that. So notable characteristics: pistols, while limited in ammunition, give armored cossars a great first punch. So of course because they're the armored infantry, they have more focus on actually getting stuck into combat, which I like. You know the fact their gear has done that. They could have easily been given you know like a long range thing like a bow, so they'd behave much like the other cossars, but armored. Think uh, archers or Archers brackets with light armor of the of the high elves just boring like who cares it's just the it's direct upgrade There's no place for both of them in line, you know, but these actually have slightly different uses. Yeah, you know, one's gonna be a much 
better long range thing with a good firing arc and these guys are going to be your front line in a lot of cases so it's a nice way to mix things up so pistols while limited ammunition give armored cossars a great first punch great maces crush skulls and smash armored pieces so they're the armor piercing variant obviously and they love a post battle drink i don't know how that's going to play into it but you know maybe maybe there'll be mechanics around that you never know uh Zargard. Regiments of hardened warriors formed of lesser nobles and veteran soldiers elevated to higher status from the ranks of the Kossars. The Tsar Guard are formidable, durable melee, uh, melee troops. Originally, they were inst uh, instituted to serve as the Tsar's personal retinue, and while he would invariably travel with a large warband of Tsar Guard at his back, almost every army of Kislev now boasts a regiment or two of these hardened warriors. This is because every boyar and marshal needs a steady core to their army. Veteran warriors able to act as the bulwark of the Kislevite battle line. So, you just got your armoured frontline troops here, you know. Just straight up reliable. So you've got your sword and shield variant, and uh, great sword variant. So what's really interesting here is the sword and shield variant, like nothing has shields in Kislev's army, because they're all, uh, when they're on the front line, they're not making a shield wall, are they? They're shooting someone. Like, they've all got that hybrid thing, so um, the fact that Zargard are actually just straight up, like, melee infantry is actually kind of unusual for them. But, uh, you know, kind of nice that their elite frontline troops are going to be elite frontline troops. Because, uh, so as much as I like hybrid stuff, I do love it. It's also a little bit of a pickle when it comes to things like multiplayer, because you're always going to be paying above... Uh, what your purpose for them is, right? If you have something that's a hybrid unit, then you're sort of paying for the benefits of both, even though you might only want the unit to be in your front line. In which case, you're paying for them to have the bows and the ammunition and all the rest of it. You're paying for that. Um, so the idea of having something that you can just reliably put in the front line, you're not having to pay um, sort of for an for a aspect you're not making use of is really useful. So, good. It's good there is still something that isn't hybrid. So, good. But there's still variety inherent with it because you've got the sword and shield one or the great sword one. So if you're going against a missile-focused enemy, then the sword and shield is good. If you're just wanting to chop stuff down in a hurry, great sword's good. Um, although maybe the sword and shield you might want for the higher melee defense as your front line. So there is that. But maybe you'll mix and match. You know, up to you. And you can only really say that because there are... There is the option, you know? I think that's great. So, notable characteristics. The most elite fighting force and personal guard of Zarina, Katarin. Hardy, difficult to kill, armoured, and with the option of carrying great swords into battle. While slower than their less trained peers, uh, make up for it with incredible battle capabilities. So, uh, again, I did have these guys in the demo, and they really did hold their own. But again, the stats are irrelevant. Um, I say again, I mention this every video, I have mentioned this one. Uh, unit stats and sort of their performance in the battle demo is kind of like nothing. Um, just because that demo was made so people at like IGN could play it, right? And get to the end. It wasn't just for like veterans of Total War like me. Um, so anyone could play it and experience the whole demo, right? So stats are sort of irrelevant, you know. The Kislev just had an advantage in that battle. So people could play it. So I get it, you know. But still, compared to the other units in Kislev's roster, they were very good, solid frontline. So, Kislev Cavalry, the Kosovite Dervishes. These guys are new. We haven't heard about these guys. I'm kind of sad there's not some concept art or something. Um, I hope we'll get a good look at these guys soon. Uh, but possibly the fact that we haven't seen them yet could be because they're in early development still. Um, you'd be amazed how, how close to the end of uh, development stuff still gets worked on. So, you know, could be they're not ready to show them yet. But uh, they are new as far as we're aware, you know. So, much of Kislev is known as the Oblast, a huge open wilderness. It is said that one's horse is one's life when on the Oblast. This is not a joke or an old wives' tale, but rather the cold, hard truth. If a Ki uh, Kislevite rider is freezing, they warm their steed first. If they are thirsty, it drinks before them. Why? Because without a horse, if the hunters of the Dark Gods don't catch them, the Motherland's wintry embrace will make an orphan of their children just as readily. So yeah, the horse is such an important tool. It has to, uh, its care comes first, because if it dies, you're dead. That simple. You are, you're gonna die if your horse dies. So gotta look after that first. Notable characteristics. Can sneak up to enemy lines for vanguard deployment. Ooh. Uh, incredible speed from well-bred, cared-for horses. The quintessential hit-and-run attacker. Don't leave them in a straight fight for long. So, um, 
yeah, the idea of having something that isn't like a like shock cavalry, but just light cavalry. This seems to be something that's good for harassing the, the back line. Whereas the winged lancers are much more reliable shock cavalry. These guys are actually going to be able to punch anything, you know? They're not just for, har like, harassing. Um, they're for straight up killing, right? So, I like there's a distinction. I like that win winged lancers aren't going to be the thing you use to, like, harry the enemy's back line. Because uh, they're very elite. They're very good. It always feels like a waste. Or it's just a huge expense um, to have that. I guess there is horse archers as well that you can harry the back line with. But, you know, whatever. I like that there's some dedicated um, light cavalry, uh, like the dervishes here. I think that's interesting. Uh, adds a few more tiers and a bit more variety. So, I'm cool with it. Uh, every settlement large enough to support a rotor of Kislevite winged lancers, a cavalry squadron of hardy, well-trained warriors who form the offensive heart of almost every Kislev army. Sorry, every settlement large enough will support. I think it's being up to a, up another... Anyway, whatever. Uh, they are also a potent psychological weapon. For at full gallop, they cause the very air to shudder and roar. Becoming a Kislev winged lancer takes dedication and effort, and a great deal of money to afford the thoroughbred steed, mail coat, breastplate, and helm. Only skilled warriors are accepted into their ranks, for a uh, Stanitsa can ill afford to equip layabouts, cowards, or dolts in such a manner. Notable characteristics? Their powerful charges strike fear into the enemies of Kislev. Slower, but more devastating shock cavalry than their dervish brothers, see? See what I mean? Faster, but otherwise weaker than the Griffin Legion. So, you've got tiers of different speeds, and, you know, they're going to have different uses, which uh, which I like. So, Griffin Legion. Uh, looking, I mean, if we look at the, the difference here, so all, you know, just metal armor, you know, steel, or whatever. And here it's like, emblazoned in gold. These guys, these guys have been through some nonsense. So, they're looking, they're looking feisty. Uh, so, the Griffin Legion are a standing force of highly experienced winged lancers, notable for their improved war gear as well as their prodigious skills at arms. The first loyalty of these warriors is to the throne of Kislev. They place their duty to the Queen above all other... Pardon me. Above all other obligations. They often serve as a mercenary army for allied powers at times when Kislev is not currently fighting a war. Uh, I'm pretty sure there's a permanent uh, base uh, for the Griffin Legion. Um, there's actually a, a, a place in, um, I believe it's the Knights of the White Wolf, essentially have like a, like a, um, oh, what do you call it? Like a foreign exchange <laughs> program, where there's always some Griffin Legion in uh, in Middenheim, and there's always some uh, Knights of the White Wolf, Knights of Ulrich in, uh, in Kislev at any time, um, because they've had like so many wars together up against chaos, so they have a, they have a long-standing sort of, um, partnership there, which which I find quite cool. So I like that reference, I like that's something that's um, that's remaining um, sort of in the lore, you know, they haven't sort of rewritten it or anything, it's still, that's still a sort of a big facet of them, which I like. So, notable characteristics, um, oh sorry, I haven't even finished reading this bit, uh, this gives them a wealth of experience fighting different foes, and ensures that their warriors can never grow lax or allow their skills to dull from lack of use. So, very cool. Very cool. Keeps them sharp. Uh, notable characteristics. The most powerful charge Kislev can deliver. Decimating back lines and striking enemies stuck on the anvil of infantry. Rival the most powerful cavalry of the southern territories. Uh, not riding bears. That's a notable characteristic. They aren't on bears. I told you guys, you can't move for bears in this bloody roster. It's ridiculous. War bear riders. You see this? So, war bear riders. To be fair, war bear riders, right? Like you can't, you can't knock it. It's war bear riders. So just as the people of Kislev worship Urson, their god of the motherland, so too do they respect his kin, which dwell in the wild lands and forests. These are no slave beasts to be whipped or abused. Their riders honor them, and they return this honor. Only in this way can man and bear join their might to drive the hated slaves of chaos howling back into the oblast. It's cool stuff. Very cool stuff. So, notable characteristics. Riding bears. They're, they're riding bears. Uh, vastly superior to most cavalry at staying in a fight after they engage, overpowering enemies with their weapons and bears. Uh, so, they're a brawler, you know. It's um, uh, grail guardians to grail knights, you know. War bears are good, just it, remaining in combat. And then you've got the shock cavalry, right? These are the heavy cavalry, and you've got the shock cavalry in the uh, griffin riders and lancers. 
So, you know, they do the damage on the charge and then get them out of there before they take any damage uh, in kind, charge them back in again. War bears, nah, just smash. Smash stuff. They're like the Hulk, but they're bears. They're like bears. So, Kislev Missile Cavalry. Horse Archers. Horse Archers are often the only elements of Kislevite army the foe encounters. They patrol the Oblast constantly, ensuring roads are clear of bandits and roving enemies, and watching constantly for incursions from the north and east. Bands of Horse Archers are welcome wherever they go, for all know that they will fight ceaselessly to protect any Kislevite settlement from invaders. <sighs> Hello guys. I'm not bored about horse archers. I'm just quite tired. It's the end of my weekend. I'm, uh, I'm tired. So, uh, for all they know, uh, sorry, for for all know that they will fight CC protect against the element from invaders. That said, being a horse archer is not necessarily a lofty calling. Respected but not greatly envied, except by those uh, who long for the freedom of the open plains and cold nights ben uh, beneath starry skies. Notable characteristics, similar speed and vanguard deployment capabilities to dervishes. So, nice accompaniment. You've got the, the melee and the missile cavalry that can both sort of um, uh, team up together. So you've got, you know, the, the melee ones can, can help uh, uh, keep threats at bay. Things like, uh, I guess, hounds would be a great thing for chasing down horse archers. Very light cavalry, just a good charge bonus is going to deal with units like that. So... They make for ample protection against the sort of things that are quick enough to catch them, you know? So, I like that. I like they can team up. So, notable characteristics. Uh, similar speed to Vanguard deployment, blah, blah, blah. Additional power and ranged attacks makes them even more deadly. Which, uh, yeah, handy. Uh, despite their preference for bows, can hold their own in melee once ammunition is exhausted, or if they're caught unawares. So... Interesting. Interesting, the idea of um, horse archers actually being uh, a bit more rugged, you know? This sort of implies that the horse archers are a bit more elite than uh, than the dervishes are, you know? Next up, we have light war sleds. That's right, light war sleds. We have a range of war sleds, which, yeah, great, love it. So, uh, a lot of people don't love them. I love them. I think they're great, okay? I think they're fantastic. Um, I, will, I will point back to... Uh, Zara, you know, the Tsarina's expedition, okay? The Ice Queen is on a mission to go somewhere. The land is inhospitable. Of course she's going to imbue the sleds with magic so they can get around more easily. Of course they're going to do that. You know, it just seems like such an obvious thing. Um, it's one of those things where I feel like people are calling for a more grounded Kislev. I think it'd be less grounded for them not to use the things that are obviously a facet of the faction to their advantage. The idea of them not using those things to their benefit, to me, would kill the immersion more than everyone getting ice magic, you know? Just, that's just my take on it. This feels more appropriate. So anyway, light war sleds. In times of winter, the armies of Kislev must still range far and wide across brutal snow-blasted terrain. For this reason, the Kislevite armies are often supported by war sleds. Loaded with supplies, especially black powder and shot, they trail behind rotors of winged lancers or regiments of Kossar warriors. War sleds are crewed by sturdy veterans who can be trusted to stand their ground, drawn from the ranks of the Streltsy and Kossars alike. Which is cool. I like there's a, you know, a hierarchy to that. It's a promotion. To be a to be a part of this, you know, again makes it feel more believable, right? It's more immersive when you when you hear about these sort of different hierarchies and how they're recruited and whatnot. I like it. So notable characteristics like chariots, only with a large number of angry men tied to the back of several bears. Classic. <laughs> so just as capable of charging the enemy to rout them with the angry smash of bear impact, bear pact as they are to pepper them with long-range fire. So I like that versatility. Um, and again, it's, it's, that's very much a facet of uh, Kislev. It's that, um, obviously you've got those those hybrid infantry units um, that, you know, have to have a bit of everything. But generally, like it talks about the horse archers, they're usually all anyone ever sees, right? That's most invaders only ever see them. That's because that's how Kislev deals with most of its threats. It peppers things from a distance, and then it just sort of charges in when they're all but dead. Right, to just break them. Um, and that's sort of what happens. You know, it's usually the lances that do the charging at the end, but yeah, the idea of multiple units adopting that strategy and being able to work in unison with these other units, um, I think it's perfect. I think that's it, it still fits the Kislev themes really well. So I like that a lot. So heavy war sleds. 
Oh, sorry, a faster, less armoured option for the commander on the move. The light, the light war sled, then the heavy war sled. The heavier war sleds of Kislev are the motherland's answer to the Empire's war wagons. They are beautifully carved from timbers harvested from the great forests and reinforced with metal scales to protect their occupants. A combination of man catchers, pole axes, glaives, and spears grant them deadly impact in melee combat, while handguns ensure that they can pack a punch at range. These war sleds also carry an abundance of extra shot for prolonged campaigns. So, I like that it's hinting at the fact that they've probably got a lot of ammunition. Although, um, it doesn't mention that for the light war sleds. So, I kind of like that it seems like the heavier ones that are easier to catch have the most ammunition. Because that's just good for, like, gameplay balance. You know, I, I hate the idea of something that cannot be caught having near infinite ammo, right? Because then it's just, the battle can't start for hours, if that's the case. You have to just wait for your opponent to finish running out of ammo. But heavy war sleds are bound to be slower, and I mean, they're all bear-driven. Bears aren't going to be the quickest. Um, they're more tanky, brutey boys, you know. So, um, although bears are quite quick in reality, so they could be, but gameplay-wise, you know, they're a tank class, right? I think we're all aware of that. So, uh, like light war sleds, ab uh, only absolutely covered in armor with heavier bears. <laughs> covered in heavier bears. This slows them down, but makes them hardier in combat and more likely to survive should they accidentally charge an enemy back line. One of the best bear per capita returns in the army. <laughs> wonderful. That's wonderful. So, Kislev monsters and beasts. We have the Snow Leopard. So, with the Tsarina at the head of the Ice Court, storms of death await for invading armies, and the beasts of Kislev stalk the forests and oblast, seeking out her foes. One such creature is the great saber-toothed snow leopard, a fierce battle cat. Just battle cat is just superb. Battle cat. So, seeking out her foes, one such creature is the great saber-toothed uh, snow leopard, a fierce battle cat that can be trained to protect the women of the ice court. Snow leopard's natural prey are wandering herbivores. Interesting. Oh no, sorry, they're prey. Yeah, of course they are rabbits and such, but in times of famine they have been known to consume chaos beasts, taking savage delight in chomping down a troll or minotaur when the need arises. These things are serious. These things are serious. Although, I mean, that's the thing, like, uh, big cats in reality, they'll, they're sort of ambush predators, you know, they'll jump on something, one critical hit, you know, those teeth to the neck, and it doesn't matter what you are, you're dead, right? Um, so... It makes sense. So cool assassin characters, these. Notable characteristics. More than capable of taking down humongous creatures in a large enough pack. Adorable snow cats. <laughs> Love it. Which is worth a lot on its own. Absolutely. I'm totally behind that. Um, extremely fast and very capable of taking on an enemy that finds itself lagging behind the main force. So these, you know, they're ambush fighters, right? So um, they're, they're bound to be not great in sustained combat, but very high damage. And they'd be very quick. So, they're going to be able to catch things unawares, which I really like the idea of. Um, I doubt they'll have stalk or anything, but like, you know, just that speed is going to be great for hunting down sort of enemy heroes and things. So, um, can't wait. Can't wait for that. Really can't wait for that. Then we have the elemental bear, which is the polar opposite. Get it? Get it? Ah! Uh, ah! Uh, because it's a polar bear. Anyway, it's a polar opposite. Um, complete and utter opposite. Um, sort of unit to uh, to, to the, the battle cat. Battle cat. Anyway, uh, big tank. Just massive tank. Super lumbering, slow, big old damage sponge. Um, yeah. Classic. So, some say that Kislev is alive, a motherland which cares for its people and defends them in times of war. Outsiders call these claims old wives' tales, but those who have seen the land literally rise up and fight know better. Elemental bears are creatures of magical wrath are brought into sentience by the faith and devotion of the Kislevite people and imbued with the spirit of the land. Massive, terrifying, and crackling with magical energy, they are a brutal force of nature rising from the earth to fight alongside Kislev's children. So, this, again, is a topic of conversation with uh, people saying, oh, but it's not really grounded in, you know, reality, right? Kiss levels of a normal human faction. What's all this nonsense? They're supposed to be like fantasy Russia, right? Or, you know, Eastern Bloc. There's aspects of Poland and a few other bits and bobs, whatever, right? But let's just keep it simple. Fantasy Russia. 
And what is Russia's, like, biggest asset in war? It's the land. It's the land itself. You know? Um, Napoleon found that out. Hitler found that out. It's just the land itself. The idea of the land fighting back against people. Now, just having, if you're in Kislev, you suffer attrition is boring. And it doesn't really do anything in a battle. But then you've also got a bunch of bear-worshipping uh, fanatics in a universe, in a setting where faith actually has an impact on the surrounding world. So not only do they have faith in their bear god, but the bear god is the embodiment of the country itself. To, to Kislevites, they're one and the same, right? Urson is Kislev's god. It is their motherland's, you know, patron god. There's a deep connection between those things. So that worship could easily extend to the land itself becoming an avatar of this god. That's so in keeping with Warhammer. If this wasn't the case, I would be disappointed. But the idea of being able to personify within the faction the idea that the land itself is one of the deadliest threats to invaders, this is the perfect way to do that. So, infinite points to the designers for being able to do that in a way that makes perfect sense to Warhammer and all of the lore, all subject material, and is completely in keeping with the universe and the specific culture of Kislev. This obeys all the rules, and I think anyone who doesn't like it just doesn't know Warhammer. It's that simple. I just don't think they understand Warhammer. You know, the concepts of Warhammer. Um, I just don't think they get it, you know? If they want... I think they just want Empire Total War too. I think that's what they want, right? But no, this is perfect. This is absolutely spot on. And I think if they didn't have a way that the land itself could fight then that would be disappointing. And a bear in the battlefield is way more interesting than just enemies suffering attrition if they're in your land. That's boring. I want to be the one doing the damage. And this way I get to. So, you know? So, argue with me in the comments. Okay? You're wrong. So, some say the Kislev is alive, blah de blah de blah Right, did we read this? Yes, we did, we did read that. Notable characteristics, though. Biggest bear around. It's a big bear. It's a very big bear. Big old bear. Uh, as happy beating down the doors of a castle, as it is causing terror among all the tiny bipedals below it. So, uh, I like the idea of this. Uh, it's hinting at the fact it has a siege attacker, but of course it bloody does. It's a giant bear. Um, unbreakable. Irresistible. Uh, and the hardiest thing on the battlefield is a giant damage sponge. Which is very cool because, um, as we found out from the Q&A, or the AMA, or whatever you want to call it, that um, CA, Creative Assembly, the developers of this game, you know, um, that they did on Discord, we know they've already said that the uh, bear is both a summon and a unit, so you can recruit it and summon it, uh, which is really interesting. Though I do wonder if it's a summon as a result of like maybe Tempest Magic or something, or if it's like an army ability, or if they're just talking about um, the battles that we've seen so far, like the battle demo where you're in the realms of chaos and you can summon reinforcements. Um, I don't know if that's what it's talking about specifically, but hopefully there's a spell or an item or something you can summon it in, because that'd be really cool to have that turn up in, in a battlefield. I'd like that. So, Kislev Artillery, Little Grom. So, Kislev is not known for massed artillery. In fact, at many points throughout its history, the Boyars and uh, Druzina have been expressively forbidden from maintaining their own. In the reign of Tsar Alexis, a dozen new cannons were commissioned under the orders that their roar would drown out the hordes of chaos like the thunder of gods. Specifically, Tor, I suppose. The Thunderers, as they were known, not to be confused with Thunderers, <laughs> Uh, made a great difference in the battles that eventually saw the legions of chaos thrown back into the northern wastes. By the time the fighting was over, most of the twelve thunderers were lost, but a precious few remain. So I like that. I like that it's um, they haven't decided. Oh yeah, Kislev's got artillery now because of course they do, and they're everywhere. It's a similar sort of thing to uh, steam tanks, where they're they're uh, they're a very unique, uh, rare resource, but. Also, again, I love I love the fact that it's on the ice sled and everything. It makes perfect sense. The fact that bears and the ice sled, the fact they're sort of floating around, it, it fits the environment perfectly. You can't have... And the fact it's heavy artillery. It's a single artillery piece rather than like a, a, a you know, whole cabinet eight of them. But I think it makes perfect sense. I think it fits the Kislev completely. You know, they have this thing and they make it work. 
for, for the land they live in. I love it. And again, Zarin is going to throw magic at that, you know? So it's good. So notable characteristics. Long range, powerful, single artillery piece. Pulled by two bears is capable of ravaging, uh, ravaging enemies in melee as their brothers. So again, it's Kislev. They're rugged. They're rugged people. They're not going to have some piddly artillery piece that can, you know, easily be bullied. Um, what you're going to be doing is bogging it down so it can't be shooting, but you're not necessarily going to just sort of knock it out quickly with uh, light, um, you know, sort of light cavalry or something. So I like that. I like that a lot. It fits. It fits the themes very well. And uh, they can charge and collide with enemies in a pinch. Probably shouldn't rely on that, but you know, runs out of ammo, might want to get it stuck in. Lovely. Uh, and uh, we may be some time. That's all for the Kislev roster reveal. We hope it's got you excited to play Warhammer 3 and Cock Your Demons um, later in 2021. We'll have another roster reveal. Oh, let's go with soon. And we're always looking for feedback on what you want to see on TotalWar.com or on Discord. I, I like their new Discord. It's good they've set that up because it, it's just a great way for people to chat to him. It's good. Uh, or via our social media on Twitter and Instagram. And, uh, of course, Kislev. Just Kislev. Got a Kislev at the end of uh, everything. Just Kislev. Um, so, yeah, Kislev, guys. Kislev. So, I think it's great. Uh, it's got a lot of great stuff in here. Uh, I'm very happy with it. There's not a lot of new stuff from what we've seen so far. But just getting getting all this sort of clarification, all the all the different um, bits and pieces, the fact that there are just a billion different variants of different units, which I really like. I just love that as a as a thing. Um, I think it's good. I love variety. Variety is something that I I love in these games. So being able to sort of mix and match different weapon, um, you know, combinations uh, to sort of fit the purpose of whoever I'm fighting at the time, I think is really good. Like I'm a big fan of it. Um, and I, yeah, I just, I'm, I'm feeling um, greedy now. I just want to play it. I just want to play the bloody thing. So I wish they'd stop teasing us with all this nonsense, but also keep teasing us. Please keep teasing us. I want more. Feed me. Feed me more things. Um, but yeah, I can't wait. I can't wait. Kislev look really cool. I think they've really done them justice. And God, like, the, just to think, even just a year ago, the idea of Kislev being fleshed out like this, um, was sort of uh, uh, a pipe dream, you know? It was a pipe dream. We didn't really have much um, to go on in the, the old model ranges and things, but seeing all this, I am so thrilled that uh, they're doing it justice. It's looking awesome. So guys, uh, if you enjoyed this, uh, comment, like, subscribe. If you're looking to pre-order Warhammer 3, then you can get it from, uh, from my shop, uh, nexus.gg slash Janet. And uh, it should be the same price on Steam, just gives you a Steam key. Um, so if you're waiting to get like the entire series on Epic or something, um, I can't help you. Um, actually, I can use uh, Janet Double O um, uh, in the in the checkout for that because I, I I get kickbacks on that too. It's handy, but you know whatever. Uh, but yeah, get Steam key from Nexus and uh, I get a good commission from that. And uh, it's not like a key shop where they you know it's all credit card crimes. Uh, no, it's straight from the devs, so it's you know it's all legit. But it's a way for them to give money back to uh, creators at no more expense you know no additional expense for you guys so pre-order warhammer 3 there you can also pre-order the new um total war warhammer 2 dlc that is available there too and uh yeah that'll, that'll be me then so hope you enjoyed this it's been uh, it's been fun having a chat with you guys and i can't wait to do it again soon for the next roster reveal or whatever the hell else they're going to show us soon hopefully more roster reveals anyway take care guys have a good one